to begin with. One of the problems in dealing with a description of something of the arts is that so many of the terms used in the arts are used broadly as if everyone understands what they mean. This causes a problem for several reasons. In the first place, everyone does not understand what the terms mean. And when many people use such terms, they literally don't know what they're talking about. Secondly, quite often people use the terms for meanings that are actually personal to the speaker, but not shared universally across all of humanity. It is easy for the speaker to think one thing is being said, and the listener to think that something else entirely is being said. For instance, the use of the word blue is very particular to an artist painting in oil, more general to an interior decorator, and more general still to the rest of us. In Vincent van Gogh's collection of letters to his brother Theo, he virtually begs for money from his brother to get a particular shade of blue pigment. He asks on multiple occasions for this money, because he feels he cannot continue without the particular shade of blue pigment that he seeks for the sky. However, when your mother says the sky is very blue today, she probably just means that she is looking up and enjoying the view. If she calls the color sky blue, whoever she is talking to would have a general idea of what she's talking about. But Vincent van Gogh's sky blue was far more specific than that, both in what he sought and in what he meant. Thirdly, many terms in the arts become fetishized into jargon. This produces an even worse situation where a speaker or writer quite confidently uses a term, doesn't know what it means, and doesn't know that he doesn't know what it means. We will have to deal from time to time in these podcasts with this particular problem in talking about the arts. The purpose of these podcasts is to describe and discuss the processes used by someone who might be recognized as a, quote, building engineer, unquote, of a dramatic presentation. Now, already we're in trouble with terms because people in general think of the word dramatic as meaning something that is compelling and serious. This is considered the opposite of something that is fun and frivolous. Generally speaking, people would call an episode of Ray Donovan or a stage presentation of King Lear dramatic or a drama, while they would call a skit on Saturday Night Live or a stage presentation of Barefoot in the Park comedic or a comedy. However, the word dramatic in relation to dramatic presentation, used more significantly, is a term that differentiates the dramatic mode from the narrative mode in fiction. The dramatic mode in fiction actually includes drama, comedy, farce, melodrama, theater of the absurd, black comedy, uh, and all the other subgroups as well. The narrative mode in fiction today generally includes the novel, and the short story, although some people may consider narrative poetry in the same circumstance. In her book entitled Feeling in Form, American philosopher Suzanne K. Langer describes the novel of the short story, and indeed their antecedent, the epic poem, as existing in a mode of history. This is because the person who tells you the story is relating events that both began and were completed in the past. If this were not so, it would be impossible for the narrator to tell you the story fully. When he begins his story with the famous imperative statement, Call me Ishmael, the only survivor of the sinking of the Pequod in Herman Melville's novel Moby Dick, is relating events that began in a somewhat distant past and finished only somewhat more recently. The storyteller lets you know both why he went to sea and what the events were that led up to his singular survival after the death of Captain Ahab and the Great White Whale. At the end of the story, the history, told at some indeterminate time after the narrator's not drowning, is complete. Nothing else happens. It's all over. On the other hand, When Martha comes on stage in Edward Albee's play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? There is no narrator. No one is telling us anything. There is no story. The only story is beginning to unfold before us. No one involved in the story knows how it will end. 
when language begins to be used, it is because a woman comes into a room with a man, looks around, and exclaims, Jesus, and is interrupted by his attempt to quiet her, shh, before she overrides his attempt by finishing her intended initial declaration with H. Christ. The set looks like a home environment, and we presume it is. A man and a woman enter into this set, but we don't know who they are. When the woman speaks, we don't know her name is Martha. We don't know the man with her is her husband. We don't know that her husband's name is George. We don't know why they're there. We don't know where they've been. Then we hear Martha speak. She looks around the room and exclaims, only to have her exclamation interrupted, and then overrides that interruption. We don't know why she says it. We don't know why her husband interrupts her. And there's nobody to tell us any information. This is because the only two people there don't know what's going to happen either. Martha didn't know when she said, Jesus, that George was going to interrupt her and try to shush her. George doesn't know what he's going to do next. Martha doesn't know what she's going to do next. And neither of them knows what the other will do next. This is a perfect example of the dramatic mode. We know very little at the start. We watch and get small bits of information as we go, and we try to figure out what's going on as events unfold before us. Again, our experience doesn't matter if this unfolding happens in a live performance or in a performance captured by the tools of cinematography and projected on a screen. The events of the story unfold to us as they happen, and we must watch what happens to interpret the events we see properly and to find out what, indeed, the story we are watching is about. This is a totally different shape of progression than the mode of history gives an onlooker. We are not started off with information from the past being given to us in the present, and then finished off by being given other information less far away from us in the past, but in the past nonetheless, leaving us at the end of the story in our actual present time. In the dramatic mode, we are already in our actual present, and we watch the events happen before our eyes in an ever-continuing present that turns to past in an ever-continuing momentary process, in exactly the same way, by the way, that we live our lives. Because of this structure, Suzanne Langer calls the dramatic mode the mode of destiny, not history. Now, The building engineer of a presentation in the dramatic mode of fiction, whether that presentation is on stage filled with actors, lighting, costumes, and scenery, or whether that presentation has been captured with cinematic tools and is being projected on a screen, that person is called the director. It is the director's job to create a moment-by-moment presentation of events which allows the onlookers to recognize and put together the elements of the story they're being shown, not necessarily with full understanding at each moment, but with the capacity to recognize by the end of the presentation what it was that the onlookers have seen. Now, it is certainly not the easiest thing in the world to present information in the mode of history well. After all, a significant novel or short story is quite an accomplishment. But, Since the creation of the world's oldest known piece of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, written down during the Sumerian civilization millennia ago, the onlooker has had the completed story to hold in his or her own hands, fully capable of being reread, paused and thought about, or otherwise referenced for information. Now, with mystery and suspense stories, for instance, we probably have all known someone who, so unnerved and excited by the events of the narrative, quickly flips ahead to see what happens at the end of the story, long before finishing the journey to that end in the normal progression intended by the author. It should be easy to see, however, that to create a progression in the mode of destiny is a somewhat more complicated and certainly more difficult task. In the dramatic mode, every moment is presented once in a quick dissolving present that is gone forever in the blink of an eye. In this mode of presentation, there's no chance to rehear, no chance to pause and think about, and no chance to reference in any other manner. 
The presentation has to be acutely delivered so that each momentary element of the story is appreciable to the onlooker at the moment it happens and is understandable by the onlooker when the destiny of the events of the presentation has been fulfilled. In preparing the dramatic presentation for the stage or cinema, the director has two realms of problems at hand. The first concerns what he has to do. The second concerns how is he going to do it. Now, for instance, if you're going on a trip, you must first be fully cognizant of your starting point. If you don't know where you are, you'll have a very difficult time getting somewhere else. Secondly, you have to have a specific idea of where you're going, even if your destination seems general, like a tour of the South Pacific, for instance. Now, these necessary bits of information deal specifically with spatial elements. But there's another element that has to be dealt with as well, and that is the element of time. You certainly have to know when you're going to go. You may need to know how long it's going to take you to get there, and you may also need to know a specific time at which the ending of the trip must occur. It is only after you know completely where you are, where you're going, and when you're going that you have to decide how is it that you're going to get there. Therefore, the first level of these podcasts is going to deal with what it is that the director has to do. It is only after this concern has been settled that we can address properly how a director does what he has to do, by the way, whether for the stage or for the cinema. Finally, it should be noted that the majority of recordings used in these podcasts were not created for use in podcasting. They were not produced professionally, but instead were recorded informally as a record of a private class and its sessions on directing. They are now being repurposed for a wider audience and a wider dissemination of the information.